Hello, uh, good morning. My name is Paul Andrews and I am a learning technologist. I'm currently working for Newport University as the head of their Centre for Digitally Enhanced Learning. And this morning I'm going to, te well, I'm going to talk to you about this. So can you see it on the screen as well? Kind of knocking uh, about. Integrating technology into your learning culture. Just to give you um, a, a very brief uh, idea of what I do at Newport with my colleagues, one of them is with me today, it's Lindsay, she's kind of in the corner. Um, essentially, at Newport, we are a team of consultants uh, and we service the staff and the students within the university as well as external clients. And we don't get bogged down so much in the gadgets and the gizmos and the technology and the shiny, shiny. What we're more concerned with is people and how people work together, how they can communicate and get things done. So essentially what we say to people is, well, forget about what is and what isn't possible and tell us what it is you want to do. What learning experience do you want your students to actually have? And then and only then do we start thinking about what technologies we're going to use. And then it's our job to educate, we do not train, we educate people how to use the right tools to get the jobs done. So, most of the things that we actually use are free and open source. And the reason for this is because, well, if something's free and you try it as an educator and you, and you don't like it, well, it doesn't matter because you're not spent any money. But if you do like it, well then fantastic, because you can scale it and roll it out across your department, across your school, uh, for, for no cost. A lot of the things we use are also cross-platform because, as Stephen was saying, you know these things have to work on all sorts of different devices. And it also means if they're web-based, you don't have to ask IT to install them for you. So, um, so yes, yeah, so, so I've, I've chosen a picture of a mountain because sometimes when I work with, with teams of people, the perception is that integrating technology into a learning culture can seem like a bit of a mountain to climb. So the idea is we're going to start at the bottom and I'm going to take you right up to the top there and we'll see how it goes. Um, this talk should last for about 30 minutes. Uh, if you want to ask me questions, you can do. Um, but if you want to tweet me, my, my Twitter handle's there. It's at Pauls underscore eLearning. If you tweet me, I promise I will get back to each and every one of you who sends me a message on Twitter at some point during the day. So the first thing to kind of uh, talk about is what is eLearning? Because the problem with e-learning, and I've been doing this for 10 years, I've been learning technology for 10 years now, the problem with it is there is no standard definition of what it is. So in my experience, if you ask 10 people, well, what's e-learning? You're going to get 10 different answers based on their own perceptions, based on their own experiences of what it can and what it should be. In my experience, e-learning basically covers these three things. I call these things the three pillars of e-learning, or the three pillars of digitally enhanced learning. And the idea basically is that we can use technology to support administration and logistics, and by that I mean freeing up people to actually do jobs that require people. Because as educators, when I started, I used to be a maths teacher, and I found myself pulled out of the job I love doing, i.e. teaching people, and I'd spend more of my time kind of tapping numbers into spreadsheets and fiddling around with computer systems and stuff. And I didn't enter the profession to do that, I entered the profession to teach people stuff. So the idea is we try and free up that time to let people do jobs that require people. You can also use technology, hopefully, to truly enhance teaching and learning in a pedagogically sound way. I'm going to spend most of the 30 minutes talking to you about that. And then the other thing we can do is we can use the technology to enable educators to connect with one another. And it might be something as small as connecting with people who are in the same department as you, who for timetabling reasons, you never get to see. So the idea is we can use technology to talk to teams either inside our organisations, but also outside as well. And I'm going to touch on that a bit too. Okay, so when I go into places and we start talking about how people want to use technology, we tend to find that the technology isn't the problem. These days, technology isn't really a problem. All of the problems that we kind of come up against are people based, political based, or perception based. In essence, if you want to in introduce technology into any kind of learning culture, it's actually a change process. It's changing the way people think about things. It's changing the way people perceive things. And changing, in some cases, the way people go about doing things. And in my experience, these five factors across the top here are what you need to have in place in order to bring about that change. And essentially what you've got here is, if you've got all these things in place, you, your change will you know, come about. But if you're missing any one of these things, um, 
then what will you what you'll find is that you'll get one of these things happening over here. So if you don't have a vision, people get confused. If you don't have the skills, people get anxious, and so on. So when I go in and I speak to people, what I do is I actually look at them as individuals and see where they are as a team. Where, how are they feeling? Because these are the symptoms that can tell me which of these things are lacking. And then we can put those things in place. So if you're seeking to integrate technology, this isn't the only way you can do it. It's just a serving suggestion. But this might be something you want to consider if you truly want to integrate technology into your learning culture, and you're not just paying lip service to it. What I want to do now is take you through each of these in turn and give you some ideas as to how you might go about actually doing this. So the first thing we've got is vision. Now, vision's a difficult thing. And the reason why vision is a difficult thing is because when we talk about technology, many people don't know what's possible. So you only know what you've seen is possible. So when I talk about vision, I don't talk about technology, we talk about teaching and learning because all educators, hopefully everybody in this room, has a comfort zone within talking about teaching and learning. So I want to take you through two models. Now these models have been um, published by some academics. Um, the first one here, this is called the conceptualization cycle. Now when we're dealing with um, um, you know, students with technology, this basically outlines a model of what students would actually do with a technology. So I'm not talking about specific platforms, I'm not talking about Moodle or Blackboard or Google Docs or whatever it might be that you like to use. This just uh, talks about what students actually need to do online to facilitate effective teaching and learning. <coughs> and what this model basically says is this. The first thing you need is to make sure you've got the resources online. The resources could be PowerPoints, they could be handouts, they could be videos. But the point is, they need to give students the ability to grasp the concept that you're trying to teach them. That's the first thing. Now, what I tend to find is when I'm dealing with most educators, most of us in the industry think that e-learning starts and stops right here. I've done a PowerPoint, I'm going to stick it on Moodle, put a tick in the e-learning box, and I've got the button. Job done. What this model suggests, and in my experience, that actually that's okay. If you're doing that, that's not a bad thing, but what I would suggest to you is that there is more that you can do. And the idea is that if you have students able to access some resources which gives them the concepts, you then need to give them online activities which allow them to test out their understanding of those concepts. So it could be uh, some kind of formative exercise, it could be some kind of self-marking test or quiz, it could be a game, but the idea is, is they need to construct new knowledge, construct understandings based on these online activities. So, so basically, so we've got the resources and you've got, you've got, you've got your activities. But the, the third and final thing in this, in this particular cycle says, well, okay, once you've got these two things, that's great. But what you then really need to do is give your learners, your pupils, your students, the ability to talk with one another online, to share their ideas, to bounce their ideas around. Because this is kind of what people do in the workplace. It's what we as humans kind of have done for thousands of years. We seek to understand something, we test it out, and then we have a chat about it. So this is called the conceptualization cycle, and it really, really does work. And the beauty of it is, it, it works for any kind of technology, any kind of resource. So we're not tying ourselves to going, right, we've got to use Moodle, we've got to use Blackboard, we've got to use... This works with anything. And when you put these three things in, something quite magical happens, because it gives you as the educator the ability to start to bring the technology into the classroom which is where the second model comes in. Now, um, there's actually three stages to the model. This was done by an academic called Robin Mason. And what Mason said was that um, when educators start using technology, there are three kind of stages to their development. But other mod uh, I should say other models are available, but I find this to be quite elegant. It kind of works. So the idea basically is this. When people first start using technology, they dip their toe in the water, quite rightly, because it's a bit scary. And they don't want to mess things up. So what we have here is what's called a content and support model. People will do their classroom stuff, the face-to-face -face stuff here, and they will have their online stuff over here, and never the twain shall meet. I.e., I used to be a math teacher, I'm going to teach you my math stuff in the classroom, I might, stuff some, I might stick some stuff on PowerPoint online, on Moodle or something, but I'm not actually bringing it into the classroom, because I don't trust it, it's scary. Now, if you identify yourself as being at this stage, that's not a bad thing, because the emphasis is this is just a stage <laughs> in your development, in, in the process of getting more confident with the technology. And so what we tend to find is when people are at this stage, 
they're doing this stuff up here. They're putting the resources online for the students, the students can access it, but they're not necessarily letting the activities bleed into the classroom. When people get a little bit more confident, and this could take uh, like 12 months, 18 months, because you have to try all this stuff out with your students to see what works and what doesn't and what's right for you. But when you try it out, what you tend to find is you can move on to this next model, which is called the wraparound model. I like to call it the fried egg model or the sausage roll model or the Mexican hat model. Um, so it's <laughs> essentially what happens here is when you're a bit more confident with the technology, you can let the, the activities in the online area bleed into the face-to-face -face stuff. And similarly, you can let uh, the activities in the face-to-face -face area bleed out into the online arena. So an example of this might be something like if you have a discussion in the classroom and it goes really well, you might want to let that continue online later on. Let's say if you're, you know, you're, you're squeezed for time and you're timetabling. Similarly, you could get students doing stuff before the lesson, talking about stuff, doing research, whatever it might be, that then feeds into the face-to-face -face stuff. One of the key, one of the buzzwords going around at the moment is something called a flipped classroom. You might have heard of it. For those of you that watch BBC Click on the weekend, they had a whole um, kind of session on this. Incidentally, everything I'm talking about, by the way, I've made a little web page for you. I'll give you the address at the end, and it's all on there, including the BBC Click thing about the flipped classroom. Um, but essentially, when you, you know, if you start doing the flipped classroom, the idea is, in a traditional classroom, people will, you know, we as educators stand at the front, or maybe we'll, we'll you know, we'll walk around. But we disseminate the knowledge to the students. The students then, or the pupils then go home and do the homework to learn to, to understand the knowledge. The flipped classroom turns it around. It says no. When you're at home, use the online stuff to actually uh, get a handle on the knowledge, to, con to conceptualise the stuff. And then once you've got the concepts, you come into the classroom and you do the activities, you do the homework with the tutor. So the role shifts from a, an educator being someone who's like a guardian of knowledge to someone who's being a bit more of a guide. It doesn't work for everyone, it might not work for you, but it is a model worth exploring. It's worth looking up because the, the results in some of the American schools and universities have been quite incredible. So that the keyword there is flipped classroom if you want to have a Google, but I'll give you the web page at the end and there's videos you can watch on it. The final model is, um, this is kind of about the Holy Grail or the Nirvana if you like, the promised land of Eden. Uh, because this basically, for those of you who are familiar with Moodle, this is what Moodle's based on. Uh, this is this philosophy of something called social constructionism, which is people learn, coming together, working together to understand the concept. It's learning by doing. And the model basically is this. You have learning resources that are online, but they're different types of learning resources with the same learning outcome. So uh, as a student, I might go, right, I'm going to watch a video, and that will let me understand that concept. Or another student might go, no, I'm going to read something, and I understand that concept. The point is they both arrive at the same destination. They both understand the same thing, but they have chosen the path by, that they take to understand that concept. This, by the way, can take years to set up. It's not something you can do over... If, if you're kind of, like, here, then this will, to get to here takes a little bit of time. But you have the learning resources. Then you give your learners collaborative activities to do, things they can uh, actually do together. And then, and this is the scary part, how many, how many university people are we going today? Just kind of, this is a scary thing for universities because you mentioned joint assignments, they get a little bit twitchy. <laughs> um, I, the same people get twitchy when Stephen was saying about looking up an essay, you could feel people going, oh my god. Um, it's a bit scary. Um, so, but the idea is you can give people, you can give your learners joint assignments to do. Now, when I was a maths teacher, I used to hate this. Hate it. Because I knew if I had more than three people in a group, maybe four, one of them would assign themselves the role of chief nose picker. And they would stand at the back of the class and do nothing. But these days, with the technology we've got, it's possible for you to set up assignments and monitor and grade each individual student's contribution to the group as a whole. So if you want to, you can give the group a grade, but you can also assess the individual input. Depending on which tool you use, your mileage will vary. But for those of you that are kind of Moodle-centric, it does that really easily. So that's the vision. We've got skills next. Uh, now, the idea behind skills is essentially, it, it's quite difficult to get skills, to get skilled up. You know, if you're sitting there in isolation, or you're sitting there, you, you, you're in like, like a little, little cave almost, you know, you're in there in your, in your staff room thinking, how am I going to get skilled up? How am I going to upskill myself? Where's my CPD? Who's going to train me? And all that kind of thing. Now, you might have read the, the statement that came out from Leighton Andrews of developing this hub, it's about with a W, because it's Welsh, I guess. Right. But they're developing this hub. That, that it's going to allow people to come on and, and engage with other people and get uh, you know, trained up and do all, all kinds of good stuff. But 
The hub's not ready yet. And one of the things I like to do when I'm doing these talks is give people uh, ideas and advice and tips that you can use right now. So what I would suggest you do if you, if you want to get engaged in actually upskilling yourself is to get involved in one of the many communities of practice that already exist. Now a community of practice is basically a group of people who have come together to share ideas and resources and tips about doing something, whatever that something might be. Um, this is, um, I'm not going to talk you through all this, uh, but this is basically the model that IBM use. So communities of practice have been around for a, a number of years, they're very, very successful. Um, but the idea is IBM uses this and they basically have online areas with a certain functionality that let their co-workers come together and share tips, ideas and resources. From a practical point of view for educators, you can engage in communities of practice right now on places like Twitter, on LinkedIn, on the Moodle support forums. There are hundreds of thousands of educators who are ready, willing and able to give you time to give you their resources and advice for free. Because as educators, we're all kind of guilty sometimes of reinventing the wheel. We've all done it, I've done it. But the point is, most of what we teach has already been taught at least once before. And so it's sitting there somewhere on someone's USB stick or on some website somewhere. So if you engage in one of these communities of practice, if you get onto Twitter, if you get onto LinkedIn, you'll be able to connect with people that go, oh yeah, I teach counselling too. Or, oh yeah, I teach PE too. Here, have my lesson plans. I find this works with when I'm trying to teach numeracy to eight-year-olds. This works. So in addition to the things that the Welsh Assembly has planned, in addition to what, you, what your in, individual institutions have planned, the knowledge and the skills and the resources are all out there for the taking if you choose to get involved and take it. Incentives. Why should you bother? Well, if, the thing is, if we don't have incentives, um, you, people, you tend to get resistance. And resistance is one of the major, major kind of stumbling blocks when it comes to integrating technology into any kind of institution, particularly education, because the people don't get that buy-in. And it might not be buy-in at the kind of classroom level, it might be buy-in at senior management level. Um, so, I mean, I'm hoping, because you're all here today, that you kind of have an incentive for using technology in the classroom in some way, shape, or form. Maybe. Right. But, <laughs> just about, maybe. Um, but. Some educators, sometimes the incentive for them is it's going to make the student experience richer, they can do things that they couldn't do before. For some educators, it's about using the technology to reduce their workload. I'll be honest with you, there's a bit of a misnomer about that, because when you first start using the technology, wherever the technology might be, it's like going back to your first year of teaching again. So you have to kind of do a lot of work up front, but after that initial kind of hump, it's much, much easier. And if you're engaging in these communities on Twitter and LinkedIn and all these other places, it's much, much easier. But the first year, you do have to put a little bit of more effort in to get some stuff out. But once you're over that initial hump, your life will be much, much easier. But for the senior managers in the room, for those of you that are responsible for kind of strategy and finance and all that kind of stuff, if you're not aware of it, you might want to have a look at this document. Again, in the website I'll give you at the end, I've put this PDF up there anyway. This was a report done by JISC and the, and the Higher Education Academy and the Association for Learning Technology that basically went into the real tangible benefits of integrating technology into your schools, integrating technology into your colleges. And it talks about things like the financial gains that can be made. It talks about things like how you can offer courses to, to learners who are, uh, wouldn't be able to otherwise study with you because of the geography or other kind of limiting factors. It talks about how you can also upskill your staff. So again, if you are in that position, have a read of this. Uh, even if you're not, you might want to have a look. It's, quite, it's got some quite nice examples and case studies in it. But so I'm hoping this morning, I'm kind of preaching to the converted, maybe, or at least on the fence with a slight leaning. Okay, resources. Um, when I first started teaching, um, one of the problems I used to find was people would say to me, oh, Paul, there's all these websites with all these resources on. I mean, we're going back to kind of like the 2000s now. And I go on there, and there'd be like a thousand resources for teaching this and 500 resources for teaching that. And for me at least, it was too much. I got a bit like a, a rabbit or a squirrel in the headlights, I was like, ah, frozen. Um, so I decided to make my own website. And what I was going to do is basically look at all the stuff that was out there, whittle it down to the top three or four things and put it into categories. And I was only going to use it for me, it was only going to be my thing. Um, and then when I, when I became uh, like a learning technologist, I started using it with the staff I was supporting. And it's kind of grown since then. Um, 
So whilst there are other sites you can go to to get lots of learning resources, and again, this, the new the hub that's been announced is one of them, but I want to give you something today that you can use right now. Um, I just want to kind of show you this, which is my humble little effort. Um, the web address is, again, there's a link to it on the, on the main page I'm going to show you later on, but it's bit.ly forward slash Paul's eLearning. And um, just to show you a screenshot, I'll zoom in. If you want me to zoom back out against the address, I can do in a second. But essentially, this is the home page. And on here, um, you'll be able to access hundreds of resources that are completely free, all categorized by what they do. And the idea behind it, if something's going to be on this site, it has to be totally free. It has to try and be cross-platform, where possible. But the most important thing is, it has to produce good results with a minimum of effort. Because it's aimed at normal, well-balanced individuals, such as yourselves, all right? And not a bunch of IT ninjas, okay? So that's the idea. So this is, it's, the idea is it's, it's for normal teachers to come on here and go, I want to make a timeline, or I want to do a mind map or I want to edit some photos, or I want to do a podcast. Whatever it might be, you can go on there and you will find at least one tool that takes your fancy, hopefully. Okay? So other tools are available. I mean, other sites that are worth mentioning. The Learn Higher website is very, very good. The Joram website is very, very good. Um, but say, in my experience, too much choice can be just as, as, as bad as, as too little choice. So I try to have some kind of editorial control on that. So that's there if you want it. Right, the last thing, the action plan. The action plan is perhaps the most important part of, uh, of what you need to do if you're actually going to move forward. Because one of the nice things about conferences, I mean, it's, it's lovely, you know, we come here, you know, we go, I put a tie on, you know, meet people, have a bit of chit chat, have a coffee, have some nice food, it's all good. And then we go back to work. And I don't know about you, but in my experience, the vast majority of the conferences I've been to, I go back to work and then nothing happens, ever. Because there has been an action plan resulting from the day. There's been no action, there's, there's been kind of no forward momentum. It was all very nice and interesting, but it's like, what do we actually do? So what I want to give you, I want to give you a tool that you can apply today or a tool that you can start doing tomorrow with the teams that you work with. And this is the exact same methodology that me and my guys in Newport, we use with all of our staff. And the methodology is called scenario-based design. And I'll we'll talk you through this. And the beauty of scenario-based design is it doesn't require any... Um, expert technical knowledge at all. It's all focused around teaching and learning and on the student experience. So at Newport, you know, we have people that teach counselling and we have te people that teach sports and we have people that teach computer games design. Now obviously, within that, and, and, and everything else in between, and within that spectrum of people, there's going to be a whole lot of people that are really comfortable with technology and a whole lot of people that are really scared of it. But this it's a great leveler for all of them because it says forget about all of the technology, forget about dropping names like Twitter and Facebook and all that stuff. Let's talk about teaching and learning. So what we say to people is, tell us a story. Tell us what it is you want your students to do. Imagine if you could wave a magic wand. In six months' time, what would your learning environment look like? And so they do. I'm going to zoom in, it's a bit dinky. And it's a plain English story. And for those of you that can't make it out on the TVs, I'll, I'll read a little bit out to you. This is, a, this is an actual example, a real, a real one from Newport. So we've got Charlie enters the module, she finds the discussion forum, she reads the comments, she selects the comments, puts together her response, blah, 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 blah. It basically talks about how that person is going to interact. It's not name dropping any particular tool. The idea then is, we then get that tutor, the academic, the lecturer, the teacher, to highlight the verbs, the doing words. Sounds a little bit noddy, but there's a point to this. And the point is this. If we know what we want the students to do, then we can identify the tools and technologies and the functionality they need to have to enable the student to do the things we want them to do. So the idea basically is we, we highlight all the verbs and then we put them into a little table to identify what our requirements are. So we have this little table here. And what we do is we categorize each of those things by saying, right, each of the sentences that you've written, you've highlighted, do they fall under the one of these four categories? Are we talking about transferring information? Are we talking about assessing people's learning? Are we talking about communicating with people? Or are we talking about people creating content? And then we fill a little table in that cross-references each of these things. So we distill the story they've got into basically a criteria. Once we have the criteria, we're then able to identify what tools we're going to use. 
Now, because I know some of you are using Moodle here, I've used the next slide as, as an example, but you can do this just as well with Blackboard or any other tool that you want. Um, you might have seen this before if you use Moodle. This is the Moodle tool guide for teachers, and it was released in the Moodle community a number of years ago. And it uses exactly the same headings as we've got for our scenario-based design table. So the idea is, is, it comes across the top and it says, okay, we've got information transfer, assessment of learning, communication, and co-creating content. What we then do with people is we say, right, we go back to the table you've written, and in our particular example, when we had our student here, they were talking about entering forms and reading comments and putting together responses. All of those things will come under the category of communication. So we know we need a tool that's going to allow the students to do communication. Now, for the experts in the room, you're thinking, well, this is fairly obvious. I know exactly what we're going to use. But for some of the staff we, we, we work with, for those who aren't familiar with it, this just makes things a little bit calmer for them. Because what we're then able to do is say, right, find the communication column here, go down, find the first green square that it comes to, which is this one here, and then work your way across. And they'll tell you what tool within Moodle you need to use. And so that's what we train them in. That's what we educate them in. So rather than having this kind of, we've got to show you everything that you need to know, we educate people in the tools they need to be able to get the learning experiences they want. In other words, we make sure the technology tail never wags the teaching and learning dog, which is something we have to be very, very careful of. Once we've identified what the tools are, we've trained them, we can then move on to actually creating the content. But before we do that, we say to people, look, create a mind map first. And we use a website called mind42.com. Uh, for those of you that are paying for mind mapping software, please stop. You don't need to. Mind42.com, it works, browser-based, nothing, nothing to install. Uh, it means you can make a mind map at home and pick it up in work and vice versa. And because it's online, it means you can collaborate with your colleagues. So a whole department can come together and make a mind map for a module that they want to do. This is very, very, again, other mind mapping tools are available, but this is, this is, quite a nice one, it's, it's worth having a look at. But the idea is, is everything's planned out on the mind map before we actually get into um, building the module. Because it's much easier to change things around on the mind map than it is once you've got a module halfway into construction. So that's it. In my experience, these are the factors that you need. You might be sitting there thinking right now, well, we've got all these in place, in which case, fantastic. You, but you might be sitting there thinking, oh, blimey. We need, you know, we need some of these things. The workshops that are going to go, that follow on from this will give you an opportunity to explore some of the things that you think you need, because these are just my suggestions about what you might need. But I know we're, we're interested to hear what you think you need, what support you think you need. I said at the start of this that I was going to give you a website uh, with all the links on, and uh, before I do that, I just want to leave you with this one final thought, that basically none of us are alone in this. Um, and like I said before, if you want to engage in these communities, if you want to get involved in this stuff, you can do. Everything right now is out there for the taking. The, the tools are free, the help is free, it's just a question of how bad you want this. So I guess my message to you is that if we really want to do something, we actually can. Um, and success baby says so, so it must be true. So this is the web address at the bottom here. If you, if you point your browser to it, it is case sensitive. If you point your web browser to it, it will take you to a web page with this presentation on and links to absolutely everything I've mentioned um, during the last kind of half an hour or so. Um, ladies and gents, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Um, thank you very much indeed. And if we've got time for questions, I'll be very happy to take them now. Cheers.